Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. The things that you say about as a habit of life, they will form your personal world that you live in. You better think about it. It is so true. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Baylis Conley. Do you have a desire to draw closer to God for your relationship with Him to be more real? Well, then you need to pray. I need to pray. But you know, it's important that, that when we pray, we be honest. God loves honesty. Listen, when you talk to God, when you're praying, if you're afraid, tell Him. If you're disappointed, tell Him. If you're mad at Him, tell Him because He knows it anyway. Let your request be made known, but be yourself and be honest before God. God loves an honest soul. Here's Bayless Conley with part two of his continuing message from last week. All right, look with me in the book of Numbers. Got a little more ground to cover. Numbers chapter 11. Numbers 11 and verse 4. It says, Now the mixed multitude, that is those that came out of Egypt with the Israelites, the mixed multitude, Numbers 11, 4, who were among them, yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up and there's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. All we have to eat is angel's food. <laughs> Friend, when manna no longer satisfies you, you've got a real problem. And it said that they yielded to in intense craving. That literally means uncontrolled, ravenous lust. So here's the people complaining again. Oh, back in Egypt, we had garlic and onions. Now we have to eat angel's food. Does Moses go into intercession for them? Once again, does he say, God, blot me out of your books? Here's what happened. <laughs> God gets mad, and Moses gets mad. Moses said, look, did I bring this people to birth? I can't carry them anymore. God, if you're going to treat me this way, just kill me. That's what Moses prayed. And I actually love the prayer, because it's honest. Moses is overwhelmed. He said, I can't carry them. You know, what, what is this, some nursing child I'm supposed to carry around? God, I'm done with them. And if it's going to continue on, just take me home. I'm through, I'm through, I'm through. You know, King David said in Psalm 142, he said, I poured out my complaint before the Lord. And then God gave him an answer. God loves an honest heart. When your heart's overwhelmed, talk to God about it. And so God actually tells Moses to gather the 70, Ezra, the, the 70 elders, you know, and gives him an answer and puts some of his spirit upon them. And then God sends a wind to bring quail into the camp of the Israelites. So many quail that it takes two days and one night of constant work without cessation to gather all of the quail that God had brought to them. But the Bible says, and you actually need to read this in tandem with Psalm 78 because the story is told there as well. Even though God miraculously supplies, their lust is not abated. And judgment came and the guilty parties die and they're buried. And Moses names the place the graves of lust. Not just because the instigators were buried there, but he was hoping to bury this problem of lust among God's people once and for all. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way, for the problem continued to crop up as they traveled on. And let's look 
Here's another problem came right away. Numbers 12. How many appreciate Moses a little more tonight? Oh, man. And we're not done. <laughs> 12 and verse 1. Now Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he'd married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not also spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Everybody say, uh-oh. Now, whether this was racially motivated because he married an Ethiopian woman or culturally motivated or just plain jealousy because they said, well, hey, Moses isn't the only one that God uses. God speaks through us as well. The Lord calls all three of them out. He says, why weren't you afraid to talk to my servant Moses? I speak to him face to face like no one else. And the Bible says God's presence lifted. And they looked, and Miriam, who apparently she was the eldest of the three, apparently she was the one that had uh, orchestrated the thing between her and her brother. Miriam became leprous. Friend, listen, you don't want God's presence to lift from you. You're in the danger zone when that happens. You don't want God's protecting hand to lift from you. And so there's Miriam. She's leprous, white as snow, and Moses prays a prayer of healing. Are you ready? Verse 13. It says, so Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O God, I pray. Seven words. Please heal her, O God, I pray. And the Lord healed her. I had a friend in need of healing. He actually traveled a very long distance to be in, in the meeting of a healing evangelist, a guy that really had the gifts of healing operating in his life. And, you know, I think in the prayer line or, you know, whatever stage it was in the meeting, this is all he got was a declaration. Hands were laid on him, says, be healed in Jesus' name. I think it's five words, be healed in Jesus' name. Yeah, five. And I talked to him later. He was so mad. He said, Bayless, I drove like two hours to get to this meeting and I get a five-word declaration and he moves on to the next person in line. He was still offended when he was talking to me. Now, I can guarantee you he went away without his needs being met. Can you say this with me? Heal her, oh God, I pray. Can we do that? Heal her, oh God, I pray. Pretty simple, huh? It doesn't have to be elaborate. You don't have to tell God a whole bunch of stuff he already knows. Now, be yourself. Some people, that's just you. But some people, they think they'll be heard for their much speaking, and that does not impress God. All right, a couple more things. We won't, well, in fact, look there, Numbers 14. I told you we're going to cover a lot of ground, but I'm going to go till I'm done. So, Numbers 14. They send the 12 spies into the promised land. They go in, it's everything God said. It's flowing with milk and honey. They bring back some of the fruit of the land. But 10 of the spies say, look, we can't do it. We know God says we can God says, every place the sole of your feet treads, I've given it to you, but it doesn't matter what God says, we can't do it. There's giants in there, there's walled cities, we can't. Eh. God's wrong. Except for two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb said, guys, shut up. We can't. They're, they're bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us. Don't, don't be afraid. But all of Israel sides with the ten spies. And the whole nation goes at it again. Oh, would to God. We died in the land of Egypt. Would to God, we died in the wilderness. You brought us out here to kill us. And so they vote to get rid of Moses, choose a new leader, and march back to Egypt and offer themselves for slavery to the Egyptians once again. Well, there's a lot of things we could pull out of the story, but there's one that I want you to see. And I want you to look with me at verse 20, if you would of chapter 14. Moses is talking with the Lord, I mean, talking with the Lord again. He acts as intercessor, stands in between. Verse 20, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. All right, Moses, I forgive them. 
But, everyone say but. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. Everybody say ten times. They did this over and over and over and over and over. Verse 23, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Verse 28, say to them as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. The ones that were 20 and less, God didn't hold accountable. But the other ones, they got exactly what they said. Now, I want you to listen to me. Look up here. This is, this is worth your whole price of the ticket getting in here tonight. <laughs> Moses interceded on their behalf. And God said, okay, I forgive them but they're still going to get just what they said. The things that they've been saying as a habit of life, that is what they'll partake of. They said again, wouldn't it God we died in the wilderness? Wouldn't it God we died in Egypt? You brought us out here to kill us. We're going to die. Oh, we're going to die. Wouldn't it God we're all dead? We're going to die of thirst. We're going to die of hunger. You just brought us out here to kill us, didn't you? We're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. They said it as a habit of life. And listen, no amount of intercession would change them eating the fruit of their own words, the thing they speak as a habit of life. And friends, someone can stand in the gap, Moses himself, and pray for you, and you can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, cleansed and ready for heaven. But you will still reap what you sow. The things that you say as a habit of life, they will form your personal world that you live in. You better think about it. It is so true. Moses prayed, God forgave, but God said they're still going to get what they've said, not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times. They've refused to hear my voice. They wouldn't listen to my word over and over and over. They have spoken contrary to my word, so they're going to get exactly what they have spoken. Now, the only two that got into the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. So Israel wanders in the wilderness doing laps around Mount Sinai for 40 years till all of those 20 years and older die. And then Joshua and Caleb lead the next generation into the promised land. They're the only two whose heart and lips agreed with God's word. They saw the same giants. They saw the same walled cities. They saw everything the other 10 spies saw, but they said, you know what God says is right, even if it doesn't make sense to us, even if our, our vision tells us something else, even if the majority report is different, we are going to say what God says. And they're the only ones that experience in their life the promise of God. So intercession, as beautiful as it is, no amount of it is going to change you partaking of the things that you speak as a habit of life. You will get what comes out of your heart and your mouth. You say it over and over you will eat the fruit of it. All right, let me tell you about the next one, and then I'm going to end with one. You can read this later in Numbers chapter 21, the beginning of the chapter. It's an amazing story. The Israelites are at it again. They Now they have to travel around the land of Edom because the Edomites said you can't come through our property. So their arrival time to the promised land has been delayed, and they begin to grumble and complain. Since you brought us out here to kill us, it would have been better for us to die in Egypt. It would have been better for us to, I mean, they're doing it again. Same thing. They haven't learned yet. Would have been better if we would have just died out here. And then suddenly serpents came in and began to bite the people. Many of the Israelites died. And they came to Moses. Moses, we, we've sinned. We did it again. We sinned against God. We sinned against you. We've spoken against God, against you. Please ask the Lord to get rid of the serpents. So Moses goes, intercessor. God says, okay, Moses, this is what you do. Make a serpent of bronze, put her on a pole. It'll come to pass. Everyone that sees it 
And the Hebrew says, everyone that looks at it with a steady and absorbing gaze, they'll live. And he did, makes this, this bronze serpent, puts it on the pole, everyone that looks at it, they're healed, and they live. They didn't die of their snake bites. And of course, it's a type of Christ, because Jesus said in John, I believe it's chapter 3, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It was a type of Christ. Now you think about it. How can a serpent on a pole be a type of Christ on the cross? How can, how can a serpent be a type of Christ? A serpent represents the enemy. A serpent represents the work of the enemy. In fact, you remember in, in Pharaoh's court, Moses threw his rod down. What happened to his rod? Turned into a serpent, didn't it? Pharaoh's magicians, they threw their rods down. What happened to their rods? They turned into serpents. But what did Moses' rod that had turned into a serpent do to all their rods turned into a serpent? It ate up all their serpents. Well, you know, there's a prophecy in Isaiah 11 and 1 speaking about Jesus as a rod will come out of Jesse. And my friend, on Calvary's tree, Jesus so identified with the curse, he swallowed up everything that the devil had thrown at the human race. He swallowed up sickness. He swallowed up grief. He swallowed up brokenheartedness. He swallowed up sin. He swallowed up everything that has gone wrong with humanity. He took it all into himself and died. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. Cursed is anyone that hangs on a tree so that we might go free. And anyone that beholds God's sacrifice on Calvary's tree, not just some quick glance, but with a steady and absorbing gaze and realizes what Christ has done for them, they can live. They can have eternal life. One final prayer. You ready for it? Yeah. <sighs> this prayer, God did not answer. This is the one prayer of Moses that God refused to answer. Now, we've seen the type of Calvary when the tree was thrown into the bitter waters and they were turned sweet. The serpent on the pole, a type of Calvary and Christ becoming a curse for us. But there was also another type of Christ that we read about in Moses' life. It's when the people were thirsting and God said, bring the elders, take your rod, hit the rock, and waters will come out. The New Testament tells us in particular in 1 Corinthians 10 and 4 that that rock was Christ. It's a type of Jesus Christ. We come to Numbers 20, and again, the people are complaining, and they're accusing. Would to God we died. There's nothing to drink out here. There's nothing to eat out here. Why did you bring us out here, Moses? I mean, this, this was non-stop during the entire wilderness journey. Moses falls on his face to pray. And it's worth us to read these verses. Chapter 20 and verse 7. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, together with the congregation. Speak to the rock before their eyes. Everyone say, speak to the rock. And it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, nor hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I've given them. Seems pretty harsh, huh? Moses, you're not getting into the promised land. One last place, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 3, Moses is relating to the people what went on, and he tells them about a prayer he prayed to the Lord at this time. Deuteronomy 3, verse 23. Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, 
You've begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, the east. And behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. Why? Why so harsh? This is Moses that stood in the gap and said, God, blot me out of your book. Forgive them. Again and again and again. He stood for the people and said, God, have mercy on them, please. The reason God was so harsh is because this was a type of Christ. Moses in his anger ruined the type and shadow. Previously, he had hit the rock once, and out came the living waters, and now God says, you just need to speak to the rock, and the waters will come out. But Moses, in his anger, took his rod, and he hit the rock several more times. Friend, Jesus only needed to be smitten once upon Calvary's tree. And then from that point on, anyone that speaks to him and confesses him as Lord, outflow rivers of living water and change people's lives. He didn't need to be smitten again and again. It was one sacrifice for all time, paid for all the sins of all of mankind in every generation. There is no more sacrifice. Jesus is it. He died once for all. And it was so serious. God is looking at the multiplied billions of people hanging in the balance and realizing the importance of this type and shadow. Moses, there's eternal souls hanging in the balance, people that will spend an eternity with me or separated from me. And you ruined that which points to my son, the one and only way of salvation. So no, Moses, you won't get in. You understand it when you think of the gravity from God's point of view. Just now, if you wouldn't mind, close your eyes, bow your head just for a moment. Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Have you accepted God's one and only sacrifice? The one who when his work on Calvary is applied to our lives. It turns the bitter waters of life sweet. The one who became a curse that we might know the blessing of God in our life. The one who knew no sin but was made to be sin for us that we might be made right with God. The one that was smitten. The righteous and the holy and the innocent one that was judged for our sin because of his sacrifice, now freely, rivers of living water pour out to anyone that will drink. Doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, how far you've strayed, my friend, God loves you. And it's time for you to come home. I want you to right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. If you'll get serious with God and say these words to him, God will meet you, my friend. Just take a moment. Pray with me. Say it out loud. So, God, I come to you. I believe your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for me. And he took away my sin. And he offers me his righteousness. Jesus, you didn't have to do it, but you did. And I am so thankful. I accept your grace, your goodness, and your mercy. Wash me clean. Give me a new life, I pray. 
I put my trust in you, Jesus. I believe you have been raised from the dead. And from this moment on, my life is yours. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Awesome. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. I hope that you found something in the message today that helped you. And I just want to encourage you, do something with what you heard. You know, the, the only word, the only word of God that we truly know is the word that we put into practice. So maybe even set your alarm 10 minutes earlier and, and spend five minutes when you get up in the morning. Give God the first five minutes of your day, if that's a starting point, but do something. Take some time, talk to God daily. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. You know, Moses prayed one of the most profound prayers in all the Bible when he said, God, show me your glory. And that word glory, the Hebrew word means weight, mass, or substance. Moses was saying, God, I want to know who you are. Show me who you are on the inside. And God said, I'm going to make all of my goodness pass before you because, friend, he is good. I think that's an important prayer to pray, that we're not asking for God to meet our needs. We're not asking, you know, for help in some critical situation, but we're praying, God, show me your glory. Draw me closer to you. Help me to know you better. Not many people pray those kind of prayers. In fact, most of the time, our prayers tend to be crisis-driven. Why not take some time and say, God, show me who you are. Open the eyes of my understanding. I want to know you better. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's Word in our daily lives. Did you know that the Bible is full of promises? Promises from God for you, to give you hope. God means just what He says. He is faithful to His Word. Bayless Conley's inspirational calendar for the new year, A Promise is a Promise, can be yours when you contact us today. Find a new Bible verse each month to remind you that God has given us His promises because He wants to fulfill them in our lives. This calendar will help you discover who God is and learn how to make His promises a reality in your life. Call or order online now.